I believe we are live. My name is Joe Sinkwitz. I am the CEO of IntelliFluence. Uh, Masha has been getting the room all set up, so I believe that we are ready to go. It looks like we are on the air. What I'm going to do is start my screen share and walk through the presentation that I have for you today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll try to get to those at the end. I believe a couple other questions were emailed to me prior, so I'll address those at the end as well. So without any further ado, I'll go ahead and kick off. All right, so welcome to uh, Influencers, which uh, I believe are the Swiss army knives of the internet and why I believe that you should be using them. Uh, again, my, my name is Joe Sinkwitz. I've been in the search industry uh, since 1997. I cut my teeth on the esteemed industries of Viagra, payday loans, car insurance, poker, casino, all the really clean industries out there. Uh, presently, I'm the founder and CEO of IntelliFluence. Uh, I've, via my agency and via the platform, I've managed thousands of clients. And I've been really lucky because I've gotten to play in a lot of different facets of online marketing, which has given me this, uh, this broad perspective of how to approach digital marketing as a whole. And so what we're going to talk about today is influencers. And there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about what influencers are, how you should use them, you know, why they even exist. And so we need to back up a little bit. We need to talk about where these misconceptions are coming from. For a period of time, people were saying, SEO is dead, inbound marketing is the only way forward. And of course it wasn't. And then some of those same people, inbound marketing is dead, content marketing is the only way. Obviously that wasn't true either. You just see the evolution going. Content marketing is dead, influencer marketing is the only way. And this keeps happening. And now some of those same voices are talking about how influencer marketing is dead, time to move on to something else. What you need to be aware of is what a lot of these companies are doing is just trying to ride an industry trend to sell the same exact product that probably hasn't evolved in 10 years just to, to recapture new queries surrounding that product. What influencer marketing is, though, boiled down, is just having someone else tell your story for you. And it could be used from everything from the business to consumer products like you you probably think about that you see on Instagram selling fit teas by a Kardashian, all the way down to business to business solutions. Now there's, there's very different paths to using influencers when there's two different products, but they could be used to both. And this influencer marketing is still growing quite rapidly. But why, why do they exist? In my view, they exist to create compulsions. So you're thinking, well, Joe, what does that really mean? Well, a few years back, Terry Godier and I coined the phrase compulsion marketing. And what we did is we took a look at video games because we play too many of them. We're taking a look and saying, you know, it's amazing that within video games, there's all these little compulsion loops where you need to get more coins in order to buy that suit of armor. And you need that suit of armor so you can get more coins. And it's just these little, little triggers that just keep you playing the game over and over and over. From a marketing perspective, it's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take these collection of activities and loop them to the point where we have that end outcome. We want to create the anxiety that is alleviated solely via purchasing a product or service. So this is actually much of a, a campaign strategy as it is an actual tactic. How did I stumble on this? Well, you know, I, from my affiliate days, you know, we, we specialized quite a bit in uh, pay-per-click, SEO, and just brute force email. And those were all extremely transactional. You know, we would, we would spin up a site and push it really hard, knowing that it would disappear within a couple months. And then we'd repeat the process over and over and over. So I understood that, that initial blast of traffic. When I joined CopyPress to, uh, as the, their CRO, uh, I kind of became converted by what their process was, dealing with elongated sales cycles of our content had using multiple touch points and then amplifying that with native ads to kind of keep that consistent branding. So it really changed my perspective. When I finally found it in Telefluence, I saw how you know, those influencers could be used to magnify the concepts of, of what I was doing back in my affiliate days, as well as what I was doing with content. So I started to play with the order of these, trying to string them along and figure out how to make 
essentially the most money. The way that we need to do, though, is we need to understand within compulsions, how are we even doing that? We have to play on some key psychological drivers. There's, there's really four that I'm going to pay attention to. First is hero worship, you know, that, that what we aspire towards. Underneath that celebrity type influences, there's an appeal to authority. This is when you, when you let an expert essentially do the thinking for you. You don't have time to become an expert in cars. You might, uh, you know, utilize your mechanic to be your expert in terms of his uh, decision making for you. Wealth signals are essentially that that peer level influence. What your neighbor's doing, what your coworker's doing. And the pack mentality, the unity signal from Cialdini, is really just the repetition aspect of it. Dissecting a little bit further, uh, hero worship, uh, what I like to talk about is being like Mike. Now, obviously, this documentary just came out, and it's really good timing here. I will never dunk a basketball like Michael Jordan. That's just not going to happen. But I could buy Gatorade. I can wear Air Jordans and still not dunk a basketball. Aspirational influence, it's the most pervasive out there. That's what most people think about when they think about influencer marketing. They see that consumer product pitched by a celebrity. And that is really the best usage of that, is when you have a very mass consumption-oriented product. That's when it works. And an appeal to authority, uh, I don't know uh, how many of you are familiar with Matthew Barbie. He runs uh, uh, HubSpot's growth and SEO team. You know, he's an authority in the enterprise SEO space. So when he's talking about enterprise SEO, people are going to listen. So if he goes to his list, and let's say I hired him uh, to speak upon my behalf, saying, okay, hey, uh, enterprise SEO acolytes, I use IntelliFluence, and it's making me a lot of money. Well, then I'm going to probably get some sales from that because people – are appealing to uh, to his expertise. They're saying, yeah, you know, you know what? If, if, if Matthew is saying that this works, this probably works. However, what's different between celebrity influence and author authoritative influence is that authority could be wasted. You know, a celebrity can, can pitch all kinds of random stuff and they can get away with it because they're a little bit different from the rest of us. If an authority misuses his position or her position, it can come crashing down really, really fast. So if he hit the same list and talked about how to grow a quality beard, people would immediately unsubscribe. The joke of it being Matthew cannot actually grow a beard. Wealth signals, this is the easiest one to, to, to generally understand. It's your neighbors. You know, we all want what our heroes have, but we have to have what our neighbors have. Uh, the, the example that I like to think about right now is the Tesla Cybertruck. If my neighbor across the street gets one, Cool, that, that doesn't mean a whole lot, but that's neat. I'm probably going to go take a look at it. I already have a deposit on the one that's refundable. Maybe I'll get it. Maybe I won't. But then if another neighbor gets one, and then another neighbor, I'm going to start feeling this pressure. And even though I'd like to think as a marketer that I'm immune to this, on some psychological level, I am hearing the same thing. If, if my peer is doing something and I'm not, are they my peer anymore? And then it gets magnified because there's a pack mentality that comes in on top of that peer pressure. Cialdini talked about it when he was writing uh, the revised version of Psychology of Influence. Uh, he talks about unity, that sense of belonging. It's essentially peer magnified, and it could be manipulated. Because if, if you are outside of that pack, you need something. You don't just want it in order to catch up. And it's, it's really where, where minor trends become fads really quick and then disappear. It's because of that unity. I'm dating myself, I am somewhat old now. And then in the late 80s, everyone wore swatch watches. There's no great reason for it, it just became popular and then everyone had to have one in order to fit in. Same thing with rollerblades in the 1990s. It's where trends are made and killed. But how does this actually work? Well, the, the compulsion for you know, the purposes of marketing campaign is to, to have that KPI at the end in sales. There's a couple different ways that I like to structure it, and it really depends upon the, the product you're, you're serving. What I like to do, though, is usually start with a celebrity if I can. And if it's, if it's too cost prohibitive, I'll start with a, an authoritative expert in the space, and I'll develop really long format content, uh, YouTube uh, videos, really, really in-depth blog posts. Then what I'm going to do is I want to take the next 
tier down of experts, people that are in that particular industry that are seen as maybe not an expert, but a better seen as you know a practitioner. And I want them to share the post, obviously, but I also want them to write about it. I want them to have reactions to the video, reactions to what was written. Those reactions start to, to play with your head a little bit because now what you're seeing is you're seeing an agreement from people that aren't quite your peers. Maybe they're a little higher than you in terms of peer level, but they're all taking that similar position. Then next down, I want to say, okay, who are the consumers of this particular product or service? I want to get similar uh, demographics and I want them to share it like crazy, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, whatever the, the, the relevant networks are, get them to share it like crazy. That is then creating this unity. The bear trap has been spun. I have to purchase the product at that point. There's different ways to do this uh, in that whole process. I'm usually trying to collect as many emails as I possibly can because I want to uh, keep hitting them with multiple touches to let them know this product exists, show all these experts that are for this product why I have not purchased this product yet. It, it works really well in, in like that make uh, money from home space, which is why they use those funnels so, uh, so dastardly. So let's get a little bit tactical. Let's, let's shift back to the influencers a little bit more. How can they actually be used? Like what are the use cases for influencers? I like to use them in a few different ways. And I like to use them at through each of these levels. The first is pre-launch product testing, where you're, you're, you're basically you're, you're looking at things before you've really pushed out to the general audience. You could use them for social proof, obviously for social sales, which we kind of covered a little bit, the amplification, the branding, which is, you know, really the repetition, and then SEO. You know, for this, I'm just going to say it's really acquiring links, but, you know, I don't have to tell you. That's, that's what half of the game that we play is. And to cheat, I'm going to show you, like, different screens of my own software. You could use these concepts on any platform, so don't feel free or don't think that you're locked into just what I'm talking about. On pre-launch product testing, the, the takeaway you really have to think about is what, what do you need to test the most? So uh, if you're doing like a physical product, maybe you're testing red versus green versus blue. You know, does the, the buying audience view them differently? Maybe it's lot sizes. Are you selling three to a package, five to a package, 10 to a package? It could even be what network you're testing. You know, uh, is your audience more likely to purchase it from Instagram, YouTube, or via a blog? Or maybe you're testing the audience itself. You're not sure if your product's gonna work best with uh, surfers in California or skiers in Colorado for your lip balm. So that there's lots of different ways to approach this. The example I have here is we worked with Ghostbed, and I'll, I'll use Ghostbed all the way through, for, for one of their pillow campaigns. And in the campaign, before we even launched, we wanted to understand where is the product actually going to be uh, desired most by influencers. So we tested out YouTube, Instagram, and blog in this example. All we did was just put it in our internal marketplace and see how many people applied to work with us within a short period of time. And as you can probably see by the status bar, uh, the it, for whatever reason, Instagram took off really fast. Thankfully, all three campaigns ended up working well for the client, but Instagram was the early leader. So that was a, a, a quick way for us to get data to say like, hey, when we need to devote budget more later on, we're going to need to pay close attention to Instagram because maybe it's because it's a visual product. Maybe there's some underlying aspect of the product that I'm not even aware of, but the data tells me Instagram was the right one. For social proof, uh, what you're able to do is use some of the, the, the people that you already used in the pre-launch product testing. What you're doing here is you're, you're trying to load a page and showing different content based on the refer. Simple as that. In this particular case here, if someone's coming in cold from organic traffic, or maybe they're coming from YouTube, we might show them an em embedded video from YouTube because we're able to show that uh, you know, someone coming from YouTube, seeing YouTube, there's that little psychological trigger of just like me, or I am related to what I am now seeing. You could do the same thing for, for any type of tiling, uh, you know, showing an Instagram card, a, a tweet, an embedded tweet, uh, maybe it's a link to a blog post, whatever it might be. See, and, you know, when we're testing out Twitter, 
uh, for whatever reason, and this is probably different now, which is, uh, you know, you do have to kind of constantly test uh, to periodically come back through and refresh which ones you're showing. But this, uh, this spotlight by Jeffrey Powers did really well. It was kind of crazy. Right now we have reverted. Like after I created the presentation, our data has already changed. Now we're showing that uh, the intro uh, YouTube video for almost everyone because it, it did well enough for all channels. But this is just one of those things for social proof that you could do. And it's not always about going for the pure physical beauty. Uh, one of the examples that I think was emailed to me and this question was water filtration systems. It wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to, to use the hero imagery of you know, an attractive individual in, in a swimsuit holding a water filtration system. But maybe it would make sense to get into the mind of the audience. You know, that family that was just playing outdoors that came inside, they're, they're a little bit hot, they're going around, they're getting the water, it's pure, it's crisp, it's clean, and they're just chugging it down. That's the audience, that's the buyer. They're looking for, oh, if I have clean water, these problems X, Y, Z no longer apply to me. You're alleviating the problem with the purchase of your product. So in that particular social proof, you would want whatever's going to convey best to the audience. It may not always be who the audience is, but it's always going to be who the audience wants to be. This is just an example here of we went through and uh, from the social, we, we, we looked at the pre-launch test stuff, and then we picked some uh, people from uh, uh, the campaigns that we ran to use for the social proof piece. Social sales is, is again, pretty straightforward. You know, Kim Kardashian and her family have gotten in trouble for it multiple times for not disclosing. Uh, a quick sidebar, disclose your social posts as being compensated. It doesn't actually hurt you in terms of the end conversions. And, and because of that, you should do it just to, to bypass any potential difficulty you have with FTC or whatever ruling body from the jurisdictions that you happen to operate in. Now, again, this does tend to work best with uh, mass mic, uh, market items of broad appeal. And that's why you tend to see celebrities doing it. But what I like to do before I even get to the celebrity piece, if I'm still testing things out, is I wanna, I wanna find those micro influencers and I want them to test. I want them to try to push social sales. So I could see which audience worked best. I may have some preconceived notions, but again, data trumps whatever a CEO doing sales tells you. I might see, okay, this, this particular, the Colorado skier did better than the California surfer, even though I thought it was gonna be different. From there, then I could then I can afford to go a little bit bigger and say, oh, now I want professional skiers. Now I can get into that channel. Whereas if I had just started with the celebrity, I might have been wasting a lot of money. Go for the categorical fit and then go for the audience after that. This is just an example here of traversing some discovery screens, picking, you know, I think for this particular case, I was looking for entertainment and uh, music artists. Uh, this is how you could go and find larger people, but you could obviously go and start smaller. And when you're doing social sales, you're going to have to track them some way. There's a couple different ways that I like to look at it. Uh, now, I don't list using a short code here. You certainly could use shortened URLs. The problem, though, is it becomes a lot easier to traverse your campaigns. And for someone to try to figure out what you did as a competitor and replicate. So I, I don't really like to do that. Instead, I, I talk about a couple concepts. One is just doing a UTM campaign. Uh, they're, they're very straightforward set up. You're working with three variables max and within a, a, a string uh, within your URL. It's fairly easy. You just give uh, each influencer its own unique URL uh, where you can change. Maybe you're working with Sally, and Sally uh, is going to do campaigns for you on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You'll want to know that it came from Sally, from Instagram, and maybe related to the specific campaign. Maybe it was for the uh, the sample pack lip balm, whatever it might be. Coupon codes, they work well, especially if you're trying to drive sales from the audience because everyone likes a deal. And most influencers love being able to give deals to their audience because they're delivering value. They don't, I mean, they love that the fact that they're getting sales for you because it helps them understand their own value. Uh, in terms of like what pricing they could set. But those coupons are gonna leak out. 
if someone has you give a great deal to an influencer that use it on Instagram, it's going to end up on a deal site. But sales are sales, so don't let it discourage you from using coupons too much. In fact, you could you can go even further. You could provide specialized coupons with the UTM tracking. So you could do uh, specialized coupons for Instagram for Sally, and maybe uh, Instagram. I'm sorry, uh, Twitter Sally, Facebook Sally, whatever it might be. From there, you're, you get another data point where you can get it at the end of a campaign to take a look at and say, well, you know what's interesting is we didn't get a whole lot of sales coming through the UTM campaign for Sally on Instagram, but that coupon code was used quite a bit, which would seem to indicate someone in their audience in Instagram shared it out more broadly, which ended up resulting in, in sales. And from that data, you can try to extrapolate how you should be spending your budget. Social location is a really simple concept. Um, if, if you have a social post that's already working, like a tweet, you know, it, it, it keeps delivering traffic, keep, do some retweets, simple as that. If you have a blog post that's converting the way you went from organic search, get it reblogged, get it posted on the social platforms just to try to get more eyeballs on it. it. It's usually a very low cost strategy and a really simple one to start with when you're dipping your toes into influencer marketing. It's a very uh, simple process. You know, it's a matter of creating a campaign. This is a joke. We're not going to do it for $200 for guru pants. I, I'm allergic to gurus. But it, it's simple as that. You, you take it, you say what you're looking to do, and the turnaround time is generally pretty quick because it takes very little effort, which is why you can get away with uh, only paying uh, a little bit of cash. You could also be sneakier, too. So again, like it goes back to the compulsion marketing concepts. I like doing those YouTube videos, those really in-depth videos. Now, let's say it's in one of these uh, difficult, boring industries like um, cybersecurity. You know, it's really hard to find influencers in cybersecurity. You go to Jeremiah Grossman, you go to Robert Hansen. There's like these big minds. They charge a lot, a lot of money. If you could find one expert in cybersecurity and created a really in-depth video, you could then go to bloggers and start to pay the bloggers to embed the video and just discuss the video. Maybe not discussing the solution that that particular expert was talking about, but just talking about the video. That way you end up saving money on this, this high cost, difficult to explain product, and you're, you're hitting all the touch points within search. You know, the, if you look at the content, it's very focused on your product and your industry without having to disclose that it's a personal endorsement of the product because it wasn't, it was a reaction. So you're able to do these reaction videos, these reaction blog posts. You're generating additional views from your videos when you're doing this and you have little more information links back to your site for search purposes. So you're able to kind of do the social amplification in sneakier ways for really difficult goal sets. So I've, I've seen it work in a lot of different cases and that's, it's one of those uh, strategies I almost always recommend because it, it's it's difficult to fail on if you if you handle it correctly. The branding, of course, you know, it can mean a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. Uh, for our purposes, we're just talking about reach and repetition. I'm going for that unity, that pack mentality, the pile on. I want that compulsion to turn into a sale, and that could just be as simple as amplifying successful posts again and again and again. We've all probably follow people on Twitter that you see them sharing a post every couple months, the same post. And it could be a little bit annoying. Maybe they, they have it all just, uh, you know, uh, scheduled out via Hootsuite or TweetDeck. But there's a reason they're doing it. One, they could be lazy, yes. But two, it's working. All they're doing is consistently putting it out in front of you to make sure that you are, you're taking action on, on their product. Uh, it, it's... It's one of those things where, you know, I, I like to aim for seven touch points. Um, there's, there's another strategy I want to talk about, though, too. It, it's kind of came to me. This, this is something I do it in Telefluence. So when influencers, uh, they sign up, they, they go through some hoops to, to get to, like, a full account score, uh, which, which brands use to, to determine who to hire. One of those little hoops I ask for is that they just go and share a simple tweet. And it, it acts as a flywheel to keep getting us more, more traffic and sales. Um, but the, the, the strategy I want to talk about for additional branding ideas is if you're working with people on Facebook, 
Uh, some influencers in Facebook are opted into the creator program on Facebook. What's really cool about that is if you work with one of them on a, on a, on a review, you could then boost their post within Facebook ads. And I, I'm not entirely sure why it works as well as it does, but that user generated content ad tends to outperform uh, the typical agency created ads by significant margin. I, I'd say absolutely test it because it's a very low cost thing that you could do, whether you find them organically through my platform, someone else's platform, that's a really fun test to look into. So SEO, uh, again, I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, Lauren Baker joked that I ended up creating TextLink Ads 2.0. Not what I was intending to do, but because a lot of our contacts came from search, it just sort of uh, organically happened this way. Uh, the, for the bloggers that were onboarding, we're scoring. Uh, we're running it through Link Research Tools, Alexa, Majestic, Moz, and SEMrush. So whatever your sweet spot that you look for, we, we probably have a rough uh, approximation for you uh, to, to find the people that you want. What's, what's interesting about these people though, is it's a lot different from just approaching a blogger and saying, I wanna buy a post on your site. It's because of psychology, once again. You know, they're, these influencers, they're used to dealing with brands and not a throwaway affiliate site. Because of that, they're less likely to have their domain burned because these brands are not trying to, you know, use them as a, as a temporary source of, uh, of link equity and then, you know, run them into the ground. They're looking for longer term relationships usually. Further, uh, there, there's something interesting that occurs where if you go to a, like, a, like a forum, like a blackout world uh, or a traffic planet, you know, you're going to find a lot of links that are, you know, really priced out explicitly. I'll give you $50 for a DA score over 15, whatever it might be. Those people have a very fixed understanding of what their pricing is for a blog post. However, when you're working with an influencer that happens to have a blog, what you're doing is asking them to apply their ego. You are a master in this subject. I would love if you would write about my product because you're a master. What is your rate? For whatever reason, it tends to be a little lower than the other. Go back, you know, what I didn't mention is the other reason that why influencers tend to work really great for getting links is they don't tend to go outside their, their core competence all that much. You know, we had a lot of CBD offers come through uh, starting a couple of years ago, and it really ramped up as that industry exploded. You're not going to find too many of our home and garden bloggers taking those opportunities, though. But you'll find plenty of people in the health space that are because that's what's relevant to them. Doing so in our system and most systems is pretty easy. I'm looking for a blog review. You fill it out. You, you let them know what you're looking for. I like to give do's and don'ts whenever I'm working with influencers, just so they understand what I'm looking for. Uh, what I do not do is get crazy on them when it comes to the nofollow. Let it be. You know, if, if they decide to nofollow a post, let it be. Uh, nofollow does pass an appropriate value. So don't, don't get hung up on that. And plus, you don't want to risk... Um, them getting upset and then talking about how you're trying to circumvent FTC. Just let it be. Uh, it, it's going to be a mix of uh, regular followed links and then no follow. That's just how the, uh, the reality of the world. Uh, working with them is, is fairly easy. Um, you just collaborate with the influencers that you want and you get some outcomes like this. You know, again, this is a ghost bed with their pillow product. And it's just kind of a constant uh, a trickle of real people creating real links. What I like uh, quite a bit in our approach when we do this is we had to create an internal payment solution years ago because we had a, a fraud on uh, Amazon reviews. Uh, so in some cases, it'd be a, a brand that says, oh, I'll pay you at the end, and they wouldn't pay. Or it'd be an influencer that says, pay me up front and I'll do it because I get burned in the past. They get their money and then they leave. So what we did is we created I can't call it an escrow for legal reasons, but it has escrow-like properties, wherein a brand shows that they're good for the money, uh, the influencer does their work, and in your case, a blog post. They don't get that money until you're satisfied the blog post went live. So it helps to reduce a lot of the risk on both sides. Uh, now, I recognize, too, that some of you might be running a PBM. Uh, I, I spoke about this at Ungagged in London back in 2018. Uh, if, if you hit me up, I'll, I'll dig out the presentation and share it with you. 
the, the short version of this is uh, you should be creating unique personas for every single one of your domains, different personas, complete with social profiles. And you should be putting them in as many influencer networks as you possibly can. It's going to extend the life of your PBM because the people that want to buy links from you are going to be brands far more than just throwaway affiliate sites. So it's going to be, you're going to run less risk of getting a burned, which allows you to use them for your internal purposes for longer. And additionally, there's a cash component. You're going to get paid for the, the, the posts as well as like if you're growing your social presence at the same time, you can kind of automate it to a, a low degree. Uh, you're going to end up um, getting offers on social too. So it, it's a nice little virtuous loop that you can play with. Uh, and then I want to get to the kind of the last slide here. Um, the you know, SERP stat reached out uh, when, uh, right when, when COVID was really taken off. And so I agreed to do the, the, the webinar here. I want to try to give back as much as I possibly can. So if you have any interest in doing this, I want to make it professionally irresponsible for you not to have an account. Uh, our base plan is 99 bucks a month. If you use this code, it'll permanently take it down to $9 a month. So feel free to, to, uh, to share, use and abuse. It's all good with me. Some credits of where we got some icons for the presentation. And now what I'd like to do is end the slideshow and try to answer as many of your questions as I possibly can. So let's see here. I am going back through the, the emails that Masha sent me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how do you uh, discover and grow new influencers? So it's a, it's a great question. Uh, because our platform is a little bit different, we have what's called a warm network as opposed to cold network. So cold network is uh, actually a cold list, might be something like Ninja Outreach. They're, they're good service. It's changed hands a few times. But the way that that works is they just scrape some emails. And when you sign up, you, you might get an email that corresponds to the person. It's a decent thing for like when you're hunting for links sometimes. Uh, we no longer do that. Instead, uh, what's happening right now is uh, we only show people in our network that physically signed up to work with us. So we're constantly going and reaching out to people on Twitter. So right now we're, we're doing a big push on Twitter where we're looking for different phrases, you know, based on product uh, need from brands, you know, let's say CBD. So we're looking for anyone that's mentioning CBD, reaching out to them, onboarding them into the network so they can be used by brands. Uh, we have syndicated offer setups where uh, some of the public offers that get created come with these little offer cards. We then take the cards and share them in relevant communities on Facebook, Reddit, LinkedIn, wherever it might be in order to try to get them in, in, into the platform as well. So that's how we're, we're going about things. What do I think about TikTok influencers? I love it. I mean, uh, I like any network where we can get a public profile and then use that. And TikTok's been really great because it's growing so exceptionally fast. I was a really big fan of Vine before Twitter bought it and ran it into the ground. And TikTok kind of seemed like uh, the, the resurrection of Vine, those short format videos. You could do a lot in the short format videos. Uh, one of my business partners in the digital marketers organization, uh, Jim Christian, had a client that was doing uh, uh, automated like TV lifts that come out of your like your bed stand, like real high end uh, home entertainment stuff. And a, a random TikToker that just liked uh, mechanical videos created a video of the bed popping out and had millions and millions of views. What's really great as a brand interacting with TikTok is a lot of these influencers this is their first major platform. They're kind of new to the market and they're growing it really quick. That's their first one. Meaning that you could usually get it for less money than if you were to approach uh, a more mature network like YouTube. Uh, it reminds me a lot of YouTube 10 years ago where early YouTubers, uh, they were aware that their audience was worth something, but the, but the, mon the money really hadn't been figured out yet. No one really understood like where they should be focusing, what rates they should be setting. That's kind of how TikTok is happening now. There are some issues with TikTok due to its ownership, but um, that'll that'll be sorted out. Uh, let's see. The third question I got was uh, how to help market seemingly boring, boring less fun uh, products. Ho hopefully, I answered that within the presentation. I really wanted to. Um, I feel that if you can get an expert, and sometimes it can even be the owner of the company. If you can't figure out a way to uh, to find a, a local celebrity or someone that is uh, 
uh, a local expert in the field to discuss your product, then by all means, you know, uh, you know, bypass that. Sit down yourself, walk through the video, explain all the features. Don't be too salesy. Just just walk through and explain it all. Then you can get all the reaction videos and reaction blog posts. So even if those individuals, uh, let's say it's a, a in the in the home services market, you know, someone that specializes in lawn care may not necessarily be an expert in the home filtration water systems, but they're tangential to it. They're kind of related. They might share the same audience with someone that's looking to do all sorts of home improvement and you know uh, in the in the market for home appliances like that. So that's kind of how I'd approach that. Let's see, uh, looking at questions here. Uh, what should I do if a person don't want to use a link within the UTM parameters? Um, insist on it. I mean, like you're, you're probably not going to use the UTM links on the blog post so much, um, but you, it's not really an issue usually within something like Twitter or Facebook. Within Instagram, it could be a little bit touchy where maybe they want to shift more to coupon usage. If that's the case and you, you keep finding that you're getting a, a pushback from that, maybe drop it. Uh, I like to use it as, as, a, as a rough suggestion, but you could even uh, mention it up front, like when you're doing your offer and your pitch, say like, we need to be able to track, you know, uh, sales and activity um, by accepting you agree to place uh, a link with, you know, UTM parameters um, on your social, you know, when, when you do the review back to our site. If they disagree and they say they're not going to do it, then technically that's a violation because it's uh, it's against what they already agreed to do. In which case, you you archive the transaction and you're done with it. You kind of get out of it that way. Uh, any other questions I could help answer? All right. I, th I think Miles was asking if this is going to be recorded, and yes, it is. So at the very end, you can go back through and see all my verbal stumbles and look at my beautiful T-shirt with the Intellifluence logo. Hopefully, you got some value out of it. Um, yeah, if, if you're in the market, definitely use the coupon code to save a lot of money. And uh, we will uh, look forward to working with each one of you. I want to thank Serpstat for, for putting this all together. I know they're, uh, if, if you're a potential speaker, work with them. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll probably see over the, on LinkedIn and, and Twitter, they're promoting all their topics really heavily. So it's great as a speaker to, to have a, a partner that's doing that. So I recommend them for that. All right. So that's what we got for you today. Um, thank you for all attending. Uh, as mentioned, it is going to be recorded, so it'll go out of your email. Have a great day.